Well, I don't know. Is a self-transforming elf machine a deva? I don't, what do you mean? This is a phrase that has been associated with me for many, many years. Uh, I encounter self-transforming elf machines, uh, which are creatures, entities, perhaps, although they're not made out of matter, they're made out of, as nearly as I can figure it out, they're made out of syntax driving light. But if what your question addresses is the issue of entities on the other side, uh, there are definitely entities on the other side uh, for me, and there seem to be such for many, many other people. I'm not in any, by any standard sensitive. So if I get entities, then they are substantial and capable of defending themselves. It's one of the most challenging parts of the whole psychedelic landscape because most people can accept the idea of disordered sensory input, recovery of traumatic memory material, so forth and so on. But what are we to do with an elf? You know, that becomes a little harder to contextualize in psychoanalytic theory, although Jung did a good job when he said autonomous elements can escape from the psyche's control and present themselves as independent entities. Um, I'm not sure he's ever seen uh, a self-transforming elf machine. Oh, it's, it's the defining characteristic of the true DMT flash. I mean, it is not subtle. It's these things mob you like badly trained Rottweilers. They come bounding forward by the dozens, by the hundreds. They jump into your body. They jump out of your body. They, and I thought, you know, I mean, it maps to some degree over the archetype of the little people, the leprechaun, the fae, and being Irish and being Jungian, I'm willing to entertain, you know, maybe I have a special uh, relationship to this stuff. But then in the Amazon, the people using DMT that I studied in the early 70s, the reason they did it, they said, was to, t to speak with the little people. Uh, what puzzles me about my contacts with these beings is it, it conforms to, let's say, the Irish model. They are small, they live under hills, or when you're with them you have a sense that you are somehow underground. They are full of merriment, almost to a manic and frightening level. It's sort of like a Bugs Bunny cartoon gone berserk. They are friendly, but play rough. In other words, it's a land of explosions and falling anvils. It's uh, like a roadrunner cartoon or something. But the overwhelming feeling is love, but I spell it L-U-V to distinguish it from the ordinary kind because it's just this kind of crazy childish affection. And they're delighted to have me in their presence. Well, now that all sort of corresponds with the Irish model or with worldwide folklore of little creatures, little people in the woods. Mm -hmm. What's happening that is not mappable onto fairyland or leprechauns or Findhornian beings or anything like that or anything else I've ever heard of is that these entities have an agenda and it's a very curious agenda. They use a language which you see. You don't, you, it is made out of sound. In other words, it's, it, it, it is sound, but you see it in that state. And the entire point of the encounter from their perspective seems to be to teach you to do this. They want you to transform your language. They want you to speak elfish. 
And, you know, what? If you've never done DMT and you just smoked it and you're 30 seconds into this experience and, it's, and this is what it's come down to, uh, you wonder what to make of it. I've thought about this for years and years and years and I don't know why there should be an invisible syntactical intelligence giving language lessons in hyperspace, uh, but uh, that, that certainly consistently seems to be what is happening. And it seems to me that language is some kind of enterprise of human beings that is not finished that we have, we have now left the grunts and the digs of the elbow somewhat in the dust, but the most articulate, brilliantly pronounced and projected English or French or German or Chinese is still a poor carrier of our intent, a very limited bandwidth for the intense compression of data that we are trying to put across to each other. A language that you can see is far less ambiguous than a language that you hear. If I read a paragraph of Proust, then we could spend the rest of the afternoon discussing what did he mean. But if we look at a piece of sculpture by Henry Moore, we can discuss what did he mean, but at a certain level there is a kind of shared bedrock that isn't in the Proust passage. We each stop at a different level with the textual passage. With the three-dimensional object, we all sort of start from the same place and then work out our interpretations. You know, is it a nude? Is it an animal? Uh, is it bronze? Is it wood? Is it poignant, is it comical, so forth and so on. So uh, this is, a f you know, not a very scientific part of the rap because it's very hard to convince people that there are non-human intelligences this side of Ganebel Ganubi. And when you tell them that these non-human intelligences are ex accessed through the diminutive mushrooms growing on their front lawn, they just write you off as a squirrel. Uh, but this question of the non-human intelligences is very, very much on the agenda. All shamans in all times and places have, uh, have claimed this. Once you've encountered these things, you have to take them seriously. Uh, to the point of you have to understand where do they fit into the great order of being? What are these things? How can there be a life form not made of matter? In other words, how can they be intelligent and coherent but have no fixed body outline? Where are they when you're not there? Uh, is it an ongoing thing? Are they... Is something going on on this planet? Are these the controllers? Are you getting into a back channel that you weren't cleared for? Uh, or... <clears throat> and this is, to my mind, the most chilling and appalling and exhilarating possibility of all. When you go back over the shamanism thing, you say, you know, you shamans, now where is this all coming from? They will tell you it comes from ancestors. Well, that's a cheerful and fairly sanitized concept, but when you deconstruct it, ancestors are dead people. What is actually being suggested there is that there is a kind of ecology of souls, one energy threshold over, that is co-present with this world. Well, strangely enough, that's what the Irish myth of the Fae says. It says these are dead people. These are souls that linger in our environment, and this is what souls look like. Uh, Again, folklore is only a guide, but if what we are dabbling with, if what lies at the end of the road of shamanism is the dissolution of the boundary between life and death itself, then the million-year intuition that this was a path worth following will be dramatically vindicated. And one of the reasons I've preached DMT so 
furiously is I just want a larger body of people to take it so that we can compare data. Uh, we need to understand, you know, how is this possible? It raises a whole host of questions. One is, not only how is this possible, but then given that it is possible, how has it been kept secret? How can uh, millions of people go to the grave, raise children, hold jobs, so forth and so on, go to the grave, and the news of a doorway standing that agape hasn't penetrated. I mean, most people believe they're imprisoned in this world and that the only hope is maybe 15 years at the ashram and hideous acts of self-abnegation and control and so forth and so on. And actually, the boundary between us and an unspeakably bizarre world, it's 30 seconds away at any time, as long as you have DMT available to smoke. That's appalling to me. I mean, it means we don't know nothing. Yeah, well, the classical myth about leprechauns is that they want to keep you. If they catch you, they, or if you mess with them, they'll hold you. And then you have to bargain your way out. And the bargain is always the solution of a riddle. Notice that what's happening here is it's all about linguistic prowess. It's all about poetic skill. It's all about language ability. Only the eloquent, only the clever, only those who are masters of riddlery and pun are acceptable to these entities. Apparently that's what they value. Why? I guess because they're made of language. So, and, and they themselves have, when I try to describe to people what they are or what they look like, I, various things can be said. They're like self-dribbling jeweled basketballs. In other words, they don't have faces or anything, not the little yellow leather jerkins and the curved pointed shoes, not that. Dribbling self, uh, self-dribbling jeweled basketballs and they use the language to make objects. That's what this language, how this language is different from ordinary English. English, we can make meaning. The DMT language makes objects. It's like a higher dimensional language. And so these things bound forward with the complete purpose of delighting you. And they reach into the air, into their bodies, in some, into some nearby invisible dimension, and they pull out what I would call words, puns, objects, hallucinations, things which manage to be all those things simultaneously. And they say, look at this. And it's purely designed to dazzle and astound. And then a colleague will elbow the little guy aside and say, no, look at this. And they're all in front of you, chirping, clamoring. And these objects that they make begin themselves to speak and float away and reproduce. And you're, you know, you've arrived. 30 seconds ago, you were sitting in a room with your grubby friend somewhere pursuing spiritual understanding. Now this is going on. And it's very hard to not be horrified. I mean, the cognitive dissonance, the neck-snapping switch of dimensions. And then after about three, four, five minutes, it retracts. It loses its uh, vitality and it l begins to pull away from you, almost like a boat pulling away from a dock. And in fact, I had one trip where, metaphorically not having hands, they all turned and waved and said, Deja vu, deja vu, which is, of course, absurd. <laughs>